So I was originally going to start this video by walking down the street out here and telling you the beginning of a story. Except um, the wind chill right now is at least negative 5 degrees Fahrenheit, if not colder. So I'm going to bundle up, and I think it's a good time for a voiceover. Whew, all right, let's do this. In 1920, something magical was happening here. At the end of the street, a brand new lighthouse was about to be lit. The structure was finished, the hand-polished glass in the lens had been installed, and the keeper had been hired. Now, all he had to do was light it up. The lighthouse had been named the Keweenaw Waterway Lower Entrance Light, and it had been built on the lower end of the Keweenaw Peninsula's Portage Waterway. It's a shorter, safer route to the other side of the peninsula, and also home to mining cities like Houghton and Hancock. But in 1920, as the keeper climbed the stairs to his tower, the area around the lighthouse was oddly quiet. Only a few years earlier, this place would have been a riot of lights, music, and people. But now, there were just the sounds of the lake and the thunk of boots on the metal staircase. The people, the music, all of that was gone now. All of that is gone now. Because where I'm standing now, where the lighthouse keeps watch even today, there used to be an amusement park. This is the story of Michigan's White City. For context, it helps to jump back about 80 years to the 1840s. Back then, business owners were setting up shop on a little stretch of land at the entrance to the Portage Waterway. They called this area the Entry, and it was a great spot to sell supplies to anybody who needed to restock on their way into the Keweenaw. But then in the 1880s, something changed beautiful red sandstone quarries were established nearby. Architects throughout the country loved this stone, so workers started showing up to mine it, and soon it wasn't just savvy business owners on the shore here, there was a flourishing little town called Jacobsville. And as the years went on and interest in this place continued to grow, investors started looking around and realized the entry would be a really good place for an amusement park. Now, this wasn't the first time somebody had had that thought in the Keweenaw. There was already another amusement park toward the center of the peninsula, and by the mid-1910s, there were four of them. On its own, that didn't surprise me that much. People need entertainment, so it makes sense that some companies would try to make a few bucks by giving people something to do. What did surprise me is that all of these amusement parks were either started by or closely associated with transportation companies. Like the first park called Electric Park was started by a streetcar company. Two others called Crestview and Frida Park were started by local railroads. And I think it's safe to say that White City existed because of a steamship company. Because here's the thing, in the early 1900s, most people didn't own cars. So these transportation companies were making a brilliant move. They realized that they already had the infrastructure to move people around and take them places. So why not also create a place the public wants to go? It was a great way to make some extra money. Like the Copper Range Railroad Company could shuttle miners around Monday through Friday, and then on the weekends could pick up a bunch of tourists and take them to Frida Park. And this wasn't just a Michigan thing. This happened all over the country. For instance, Coney Island in New York was and is associated with railroads, and Cedar Point in Ohio had close ties to a steamship company. As for White City, its heyday started around 1908, and honestly, it sounds kind of incredible. Back then, if you wanted to visit White City, the first step was a boat ride. You would have given the very willing steamship company some of your money, hopped on a boat in a place like Houghton, and then chugged down the canal. Then when you arrived, you would have been greeted by the sounds of people and music, brought to you by a live orchestra. You might have stopped in for a dance at the pavilion, or hopped on the merry-go-round like these guys who are clearly having the best day of their entire lives. Depending on the year, you might have even and ridden White City's half mile roller coaster. Although that doesn't seem to have lasted that long considering how poorly documented it is. Meanwhile, if you were into other kinds of entertainment, you could have stopped by the back of the saloon and gone gambling or bet on rooster fights, which is a move. Finally, when you were sufficiently exhausted, you could have hit up the dining room for a Lake Superior whitefish dinner or gone to the saloon or the ice cream stand or just pitched a tent and called it a night. With that much going on, White City was wildly popular. But today, you can't see any of that. There's just the waterway and some sand underneath all that snow, 
and a lighthouse. So why did places like Cedar Point survive down in Ohio while White City disappeared? Well, different sources cite different causes for the park's downfall, but the main theme seems to be that White City was hit hard in the late 1910s. Like in 1916, Michigan adopted prohibition, which meant no more alcohol sales and no more saloon. There's also a report that says one of the park's main investors died that year. Then in 1917, the United States entered World War I. According to one historian, a lot of people around this time thought it just wasn't patriotic to take vacations while soldiers were fighting overseas. So a lot of people stayed home and money stopped flowing down the canal. As a result, White City eventually reduced itself to just a dance pavilion and a campground. But even that wasn't enough to stay financially afloat. So in 1919, they called it a day. Meanwhile, amusement parks like Cedar Point and even Hershey Park in Pennsylvania, they dealt with things like this too. It's just they had more investors to help keep them alive, they had more attractions, and they also had larger populations than the Keweenaw Peninsula. So in 1919, after years of music and people and entertainment, White City went quiet again. Or at least, almost quiet. Because as they closed the metaphorical doors, something new was happening just offshore construction was beginning on a lighthouse. With a new harbor being built in the portage, money had also been set aside to build a new light to help ships get into the canal. And in 1920, a year after the fall of White City, the first lighthouse keeper at the lower entrance light lit the lantern, flooding the canal and the surrounding lake with a beam of light that stretched out for about 10 miles. It was the end of one chapter and the start of another one. Because if you visit White City today, you won't see the merry-go-round or the roller coaster or the dance pavilion. You won't see any obvious evidence there was ever an amusement park here. But you will see the lower entrance lighthouse, and you'll see the lake and the remnants of the mountains in the background that are billions of years old. It's a much quieter place than it was more than a hundred years ago. But Really, I loved visiting White City for the same reason so many people did in 1910. The lake is a wonder, and the view is beautiful, and you really can't beat a place like this. <laughs> oh, and you know, it's also very nice in the summer. <laughs> Thanks for joining me for this story. If you wanna help me make more videos like this, the two most powerful things you can do are to share this video with a friend or on social media if you enjoyed it, or to consider supporting my work on Patreon. Over the last few months, patrons have helped me do everything from travel to White City and Big Bay Point Lighthouse, to buy history books from local authors that teach me things I couldn't learn anywhere else. So if you're currently a patron, so many thank yous to you. And if you're someone who would like to learn more about what that means, you can do so at patreon.com slash Alexis Dahl. As always, thanks again for being here and I'll see you soon. Huh, man, you know, I am all for looking nice in a video, but there's no point in looking cute if you get frostbite, kids. <laughs>